morning, wherever you are. Good to be with you again. Um, great to actually have a chance to present this. I'll give some context as we go through. But before that, um, it's always good, you know, when you have um, these commercial breaks on television, sometimes you see the same one, you know, the same advert one day after another. So I thought it was probably worth me just rerunning the advert from that I ran yesterday to say that the, um, the VSF um, YouTube site has got lots of good presentations um, that Wes has been recording and putting on there and including some fun stuff like how to make cups of tea and coffee and and some even even some musical entertainment. So it's not all deadly serious, but do go over there. Check that out. Also, my own uh, the, the organization I work for, Nevion, we have a great YouTube channel with lots of content, uh, lots of stuff with um, myself and several others contributing to there as well. So do check out those do check out those sites. Moving on to the topic in question, I want to talk about 2110 over WAN. Just to give you the context of that, there are three kind of quite closely related activity groups within the Video Services Forum um, that are actually working, you know, on collaboratively on different areas that actually have a lot of intersection here. But specifically, I'm covering 2110. It's an activity group that's been going for over two years now, um, although, albeit only meeting fortnightly. Um, sorry, every two weeks, and um, and the the context I will explain as we get there. So, what's the need for twenty one ten over one? Well, basically, you know what's happened in the last probably six years or so, I guess, is um, we have been moving to having facilities actually connected internally with IP. We've been using IP for wide area connectivity for twenty plus years. Um, but in facilities, it's relatively, relatively new. And if you like, that's the start of that was kind of, you know, it became initially just a standards like a spatial and temporal resolution agnostic internal connection. So instead of running an SDI cable, you run a 10 gig fiber. Um, but that's really only a tiny bit, that sort of agnosticism to, to the formatting of the video and audio is only a tiny bit of the benefit of going to IP. The real benefit of IP is when you start leveraging sharing of resources, you know, sharing gallery, studio floors, sharing processing resources and sharing people wherever they're located. Then you really leverage the real benefit of, of um, IP. And also, again, as, as we were talking about yesterday, it's not just IP, it's IT. We're actually leveraging the best proven practices and the scale and testing of those practices in the whole IT industry. Uh, which is very very compelling but specifically as we have moved to um a product you know to these facilities being ip connected internally suddenly we actually have the concept or the flexibility to do this this resource sharing the, the real estate the processing the people i talked about so what we need to do is share these resources across boundaries so that means you know if i'm in one location and we may be talking about you know, relatively close, or we may be talking about long haul here. But if I'm in one location, and I've got, you know, maybe a studio floor with half a dozen cameras on that somebody else wants to make use of, or it doesn't even have to be facilities like that, we can be thinking you can conceptualize it as, a, as, a, as an OB truck, you know, I've got an OB truck that has up to 24 cameras on it. And I actually want to make use of that and, and share those cameras with um, uh, somewhere else. But in the essence based 2110 environment, which we'll unpack in a minute. Before I just go to explain some of the tech detail of where we've got to, just a couple of use cases of key deployments that, um, that Nevion has been involved in, in in recent months. One is um, discovery um, in a pan-European 12, 12 countries across Europe, a, a production network. And that sharing, as I mentioned briefly yesterday, is really come into its own because um, there is that resource sharing and people sharing um, um, and facility sharing, you know, between many locations using this interconnect, interconnect technology that, that, that we've been in Nevion have been orchestrating. Um, and, you know, we start to look there about the requirements to share stuff outside of your boundaries. Also in Switzerland, there's a big deployment that we've been involved in which very much involves share the sharing of resources between locations right across the country. And we've been orchestrating that as well. Though I, I picked those two as you know recent examples of 
things where this resource sharing has become very, very important. Now, you, you saw that picture that I put up earlier that I put up many times. I showed for the very first time yesterday this picture. I wanted to put it up again because I think this as an ecosystem of where we're moving to as a like real time media production industry, this has all of the all of the elements in one nice, easy to read picture. Um, what I see is what you can see there on the right hand side of the central facility, which has got some processing, it's got some cameras, it's got some control surfaces, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you can also see on the left hand side that event location, which is maybe where the event is that could be the truck, you know, at the event, that could be a regional facility that's interconnecting. Again, there's some processing resource there, there's some control, control surfaces, there's some acquisition devices. But then we start to look at some of the other elements in here. There's 5G connected infrastructure there, you know, out, out and about portable pop up <coughs> production wirelessly connected devices with with relatively high bandwidth we've got that from home at the top right there i uh, use the word from home rather than that home from home you know literally domestic home we've seen a large pe number of people with um, control surfaces for equipment being based at home you know running on proxies and actually controlling various elements of broadcast productions literally from the garage or the dining room and then in the middle you know as well as potentially doing processing at a central facility or an event location, we've got the options of that processing being located in either private or public cloud infrastructure. So all of these bits come together and then that overarching um, element of the management of all of those that, to bring it together and make it a holistic thing, because the key thing about this kind of distributed production that we're moving towards as an industry is the user needs to have a good normal experience of production so the flexibility you know under, underpins it shouldn't impinge the operation that, that, that that's actually going on okay on to the standards and where we're where we're going with the work so as you're aware over the last five years and just you've just heard an ex excellent talk about you know the ipmx use of 2110 but the 2110 suite has been in existence and in fact we're even in the review phase now of reiterating a lot of those standards you know, tweaking them really no nothing serious but making them even better and even more flexible for what we need to do in production that data plane as i call it all of the actual media flows has been defined in, under simp t 2110 and there's a whole load of them then the top row were the ones that came first the middle row is the stuff that came second specifically draw your attention to the dash 22 compression because that's something that we're starting to embrace a lot in long haul wide area connectivity of essence based production now and then at the bottom, it's very relevant as we as I'll come back to, and you'll see in a few minutes' time when we get further through the presentation, the control plane. So this is um, arguably came a bit late to the party. If you got the vibe from the BBC Cardiff presentation yesterday, you know this was probably the least satisfactory element of their of their deployments that Mark was was talking about. But the um, that control plane is unbelievably important, and actually is the key to making things plug and play in an ip world because um without having a, a flexible and control plane then the the data plane can be um quite rigid so these were de designed these standards were designed for what i call intra facility use so for use within a broadcast center within a truck whatever whatever the entity is but within a closed environment that's a local area environment what we're seeing as i've alluded to in the in the in the pre-run to that um is an ever increasing and fast ramping up desire to actually do that stuff in a distributed manner be that just the remoting of the acquisition devices the cameras and microphones at an event and long hauling them or actually you know sharing resources facilities equipment processing um, between there so fundamentally we've got as you can see there we've got cloud we've got facilities we've got trucks you know all all uh, you know could be fulfilling different elements of that production and we've got the need to um, transport the media flows themselves and very importantly as i said the control plane and you see the padlocks we need to do it securely so that's been the focus of what this work's been looking at under the vsf in the last couple of years so there are three kind of scenarios 
three kind of use cases that probably have been led to the dominant thinking. One is kind of the, the traditional Remy, you know, remote production and where you're bringing back feeds um, essence based from an environment that's, you know, that 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 solution involves a fair bit of wide area network long haul bandwidth and allows you to do the processing either at your central facility or in a data center cloud facility. We've then got two different interconnected facility options. One is the intracompany, so two different locations that belong to the same organization where you're they want to cooperate and share resources between themselves. And then the last option there, the intercompany, where you're actually looking to share resources, maybe as a rental um, or just as a collaboration for a specific project between organizations. And as you can imagine, you know, the number of the nuances of differences between the in the edges of those facilities can become even more pronounced then. Just want to say also just to bring in a work that we talked I talked about very briefly show you the cloud to cloud logo previously, but this work applies also, you know, going to and from the cloud and we may think even a little bit about how some of it may be relevant to some degree within the cloud. Anyway, let's unpack where we've got to in the conclusion of Act One, as I described it at the beginning of the session. So there's the data plane and the control plane. Let's look at the data plane um, briefly first. So this is kind of my executive summary slide, really, of the data plane. These are the elements that we've been looking at. And, and I will just unpack each of these very briefly with a, with a few diagrams just to make sure you understand it. This actually was the easy bit. We did the easy bit first, as one often does in these things. So um, protecting the data. As you're probably aware, 2022-7 was revised a couple of years ago now to make it applicable to 20, well, to any RTP type flows, but you know that includes the, the set of essences that are defined in 2110. So, so that was kind of um, almost on a plate, but we're just using that as a, for the spatial protection. In addition, for long haul, something you wouldn't typically do in a production environment, there, you can use FEC. That's quite often used because, um, especially at high bit rates, it's very low latency and it allows you to mop up degradation, which can result in packet loss, um, especially in long haul networks, less of an issue in, um, in local area connectivity. And we've done a constrained version of 2022-5 FEC for that. Then some trunking. And um, one, one of the other things that we became aware of is there's what you're actually potentially doing between locations is carrying a multiplicity of different essence flows um especially if you've got if you're treating the audio as individual monos or even st individual stereos you know if you're actually long hauling whole productions worth of audios you've got a large number of flows there you could be talking about tens of camera feeds as well etc plus other other stuff as i say there so and what you want to do is a couple of things. First of all, you want them to route together. Secondly, you what don't want to burden or risk the service provider that you're using, not actually transporting them all over the same routes. Um, so trunking them together actually alleviates that problem. And lastly, the some of these flows can be very, very different bit rates to others. So if you think the Dash 40 flow ancillary data may be tens of kilobits per second, the order is the audio is only potentially the order of a megabit per second or even less if it's monos. Whereas those dash 30, um, the dash 20 flow, the video essence, if it's a UHD essence, is, could be 10 gigabits per second just for a single flow. So you've got many, many, many decades in, in magnitude difference between the feeds. And that's not an issue per se, but if you're trying to do things like error correction, then actually that packet processing, if you do them individually, can produce in quite significant, significant offset in relative latency incurred by the process as you go through it. So trunking potentially has benefits. Just want to say at this stage, all of these are optional elements of a toolkit, so none of them are actually mandated. And the trunking, which we were, we we're actually doing in conjunction, we, we worked on it first, but it's been adopted by RIST whilst we've been away doing our control plane work. So we're re-referencing out 
in the recommendation to the work that RIST has adopted on here. But basically, it's the third one down there. It's a it's a RTP header on a GRE encapsulation to allow us to actually carry that data. And and most importantly, it looks like RTP or it is RTP on the outer wrap. So we can apply FEC, we can apply 2022-7 to the trunk as well as the essences. Also, using the GRE wrapper actually enables us to protect other stuff. And that was one of the requirements that we had in from the user community at the beginning of the project to say, we actually want to protect stuff. Even strangely, customers sometimes want to protect in this kind of 2022-7 way resilience, even stuff that's already TCP, just because they want to wrap it all up together or other unilateral UDP flows for other things. Another key thing that's been important is actually making the definition of what happens to the timing of the relative timing of related essences as we ingress or egress a facility, um, because we, we need to make sure that the relationship between, for instance, as a key example, the video and audio is, is completely defined as you egress one location to go to another. And the recommendation we've said is that they either need to be you know, actually aligned or the, the, the RTP timestamps that they both those essences have need to f accurately represent the different, the, you know, the differential time, the differential delay between the flows. Also, we talk about compression um, and that's again, there's some references to compression um, in, in the GCCG work as well, but very specifically in the one we've been using most in real world examples to date has been 21 has been JPEG XS um, over 2110-22. So that's the data plane in very quick summary. There's more details and the documents available. And if you're not a member of the VSF, I suggest you join because it's a great organization to be part of. Um, if you are a member already, then even in these last waning couple of meetings, hopefully of this, this work, this element of this workflow, Act 2 is coming, um, you're very welcome to, to get involved. The control plane. So we left this till second, which may or may not have been a good thing to do. Um, so this is all actually about saying, you know, we've got these media flows that we can push over and, you know, and have some interoperability, you know, um, in the wide area space. But we actually need to make sure those are discoverable and controllable. Um, we, you know, at the control at the control layer and all the information is needed. So the concept we came up with is that the, the, the proxy or the gateway, whether that is a physical device or a virtual device that sits at the edge of the facility, actually it is obviously needs to have complete isolation because one of the user requirements that we had in at the beginning of the work was very much that each facility, be that a truck or a campus or whatever, needs to absolutely be autonomous and you shouldn't be able to wreck anything <laughs> you know, from outside. So the security is, is paramount. So the concept that you've got these proxy points of delineation then, and again, with you see ISO 4 there, whilst we would actually support and recommend the use of NMOS as the control plane within the facility, it's not mandated. It could be another control system there. What we are doing in the control plane in the wide area connectivity is independent of, of that. So what we have defined here, and this is, you don't need to understand all of this. I'm, I'm just showing you this to point out one or two bits, but the concept is very specifically that WAN DMZ label in the middle there, that's the no man's land. That's the point of interoperability that we are defining in this whole piece of work, both for the data plane and the control plane, but specifically for the control plane here, we're talking about basically, and the example here is that facility one on the left is actually sharing resources with facility two on the right. And what happens is there's been an agreement for those resources to be shared. The facility, the offering facility on the left makes them available at the agreed time. So there's a temporal nature to it. Those are that that's then advertised out securely and can then be consumed by the receiving facility. So that's kind of, you know, uh, a quick summary of, of how it's how it works. So just diving into what that what that kind of looks like. And one of the one of the kind of interesting and I think positive reuse aspects of the work and the conclusion we came to, because to be fair, 
We did wander in the wilderness for a handful of months as we battled around the requirements and how to accommodate what we needed to do for the control plane. And we looked at several options, but very specifically what we've come up with, what is what I can call a constrained NMOS or constrained version of some of the NMOS toolkit. So there, you have on the left-hand side there, the, um, if you'd like, nodes, things that are part of the control system of the, you know, of that facility. What we then do in our gateway function, as a be that physical virtual, that gateway effectively creates a node API and a connection API and advertises, you know, in, in an authenticated secure way to the other devices it can see um, the resources that are being proxied and made available. So the idea is, you know, a given facility will share a certain number of its resources. You're not trying to lay bare every camera, microphone, and playback server, et cetera, and graphics engine you've got in your facility. You're, you're saying, I'm going to share these eight cameras and these 12 microphones. That's the concept. So those resources that are shared are advertised um, on the external API over there. Great thing is because we're reusing NMOS, we're not we're not even making it different. We're just constraining the way we're actually using it. And again, if you want to dive into the detail, um, do get in touch and, and be part of it. But basically what's happening is all of the, the resources can be advertised securely to the to the other facilities. So when they're available, the, the they can be instantiated over the wide area connect connectivity and start consuming that bandwidth to use the signals and the information about those flows that's been you know is actually proxied across this gateway so all of the relevant information can be taken through and at the far end the reciprocal behavior happens across your physical or virtual gateway the flow comes in this constrained in MOS has advertised told you the information about it and that allows you allows you then to then populate on the gateway at the the receiving side those virtual sources that have been proxied across <coughs> the wide area connectivity the idea of all of this is it gives you um a good amount of isolation and security now again this is a toolkit you may for certain re for some reasons if you've got a single entity a single organization across multiple locations you may decide that you want to actually have <coughs> one you know, holistic system and control system that spans multiple locations in, you know, in my experience, in my Nevion experience, rather than VSF experience, in my Nevion day job experience, I would say that, you know, our, our view is probably that a, con a resilient control system per location is probably the ideal way to go. And the kind of federation work that we're talking about here resource sharing is something that we've already in, already encountered and solved within within <clears throat> you know, within the video ipath solution that we have because we've needed to embrace this concept of security and resilience within a facility as well as sharing resources but this is the you know what we're talking about here is a standardized way of that resource sharing happening so we've actually we can actually you know interoperate between multiple vendors offering and receiving those flows. So um, coming into land um, uh, shortly, um, the end is in sight for this first chapter of work. Um, we've um, finished the two drafts of the two documents, which are TRO 9-1 and 2, uh, representing the data plane and the control plane I've just outlined. Um, and we knew that's a good place for us to actually be able to offer this to the industry. Um, we're in the middle of um, reviewing those drafts and we've we're planning to do some prototyping and testing of the specifications as we've made them. So we're trying to do some what I call virtual road testing before we actually offer this out. But that's the stage this work's got to. Now, it's not the end of the road. Um, there are other requirements that I'm sure well, we've already got a list of some other things that that need to be done moving forward as well to make this even more flexible and even more plug and play. So those are things we're holding for the future. We're aiming to get this over the line very shortly now, because as I say, we've been working on it for a, a couple of years now. So the um, coming back to that picture that I showed you that I think wraps up all of the, you know, the different points that are needed um, in the in the end game, if you like, of 
of the different capabilities here, the central facility, the local facilities, the cloud infrastructure, all, all, all of these wide area pieces of interconnectivity connectivity need interoperability, both at the data plane and the control plane layer to actually have, you know, as much of a plug and play experience as possible as we actually dynamically share resources. So this kind of capability, I think it has immense use in, in, in all of the scenarios of can interconnecting the elements that you can see in this picture below in the different ways. Hopefully that's been a good update for you. As I say, it's not too late to join VSF, sign up to the group and be part of it. I say it's not the end of the road, but it's it's we're just heading towards the end of the of Act One in this piece of work. And I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved in it. We've had a great representation of what I call end customers, um, as well as enthusiastic collaborators from the industry to that have been working together to actually help make this make this work and I look forward to the next chapter. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, as always, uh, I would like to invite you um, for a nice cup of tea. I've heard since I last presented only yesterday that IBC is now not happening in September. So maybe if we're allowed to get into the USA um, for, for NAB in November 